Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me uh, thank you for coming and welcome you on behalf of Bard College. I'm Leon Boxer, I'm the president of the college, and um, I want to thank all the panelists for coming. My official duty is not only to welcome you all, but to introduce our speaker who will also run the panel. And, um, but before I do so, I want to acknowledge first and foremost uh, Betsy Eli from the class of 1965. <laughs> so Betsy has been a trustee and friend for uh, 43 years, and um, uh, her passion has been uh, the beauty of the campus and its trees and its vegetation and above all, uh, the Blythewood Garden. And uh, she'd been helped by her classmate and friend, Blythe Danner, who kindly um, joined in this effort to, uh, to raise the money to restore the garden, which was um, uh, very nicely restored uh, many years ago when this building was converted into its current use as the home of the Levy Economics Institute. I also want to thank uh, Amy Perella from the class of 99, who is our horticulturist. And, um, and also uh, Pam uh, Governale, the Director of Preservation of the Garden Conservancy, and Ann Wells, the Associate Director of the Garden Conservancy. Um, so I, I want to, um, before I introduce uh, uh, James Hall, I want to say that, um, for those of you who may not know, uh, the college, uh, when it was originally founded, uh, didn't have a garden. It was a very small piece of acreage that was ceded by John Bard from his estate. And for those of you who wander around the campus, it was centered on this side of Annandale Road with the chapel. And then when you look up, uh, the main spine of the campus it was altogether 30 acres of land and the buildings of the core of the college. And uh, alumni of the college, this was in 1860, alumni of the college who were students here between 1860 and 1951 um, understood this part of the campus today as being the um, estate of the Zabriskis who had bought the land from John Bard. It was our misfortune that John Bard died entirely bankrupt. He left his entire estate to the college, but unlike that of Matthew Vassar, his contemporary, it was filled with debts, not assets. Uh, so uh, the, um, the house that was originally here, the Zabriskis uh, built this mansion, uh, which is situated in a way to um, to make it the most comfortable. Um, uh, that's why it doesn't face the, the view directly. And um, it, uh, the Zabriskie family were the college's neighbors. Now, neighbors of colleges uh, um, don't actually like colleges. Uh, they're ambivalent <laughs> because they're undergraduates. And undergraduates, most of you were at one time 18. I mean, you couldn't have reached this age of maturity without having passed through adolescence. And most adults never tell the truth to themselves, much less to anyone else about their own adolescence. But if we're actually truthful about what we were like, as a current Supreme Court nominee realizes, um, uh, there are, <laughs> there are um, things you know we remember, we don't remember, we forget, and so forth. But um, uh, <clears throat> it can be troublesome. And so having a lot of... Uh, at that time, male undergraduates um, here, even though they were originally all um, ambitious to become priests of the church, of the Episcopal Church, with whom we remain affiliated, um, that uh, they wandered onto the property uh, uh, unwelcome. In 51, uh, the last of the Zabriskis um, uh, didn't like the college, but he hated the government more than he hated the college. So the choice was to so leave his estate with a huge tax burden and benefit to the general public or to give it to the college and elude uh, giving it directly to the federal government. Um, and so indeed, um, we were, the college got the land of the Zabriskis, which extended all the way through to Red Hook. And uh, the college, uh, it rescued the college actually, saved the college's life. The college then sold the land, all the land, uh, 
to pay for its expenses. But it held on to this property, and there was a theater in the old uh, carriage house of the, of the, um, of the Zariski estate. And uh, this building uh, was improbably turned into a women's dormitory. So Bard had become co-ed in 1948. And I think Betsy's class and many classes after that remember this fondly as a place in which they lived or they wanted to live. And um, as a girls' dormitory, it was not totally suited to that purpose. There were some offices on the first floor. And uh, uh, the... Um, the garden also became a, a place for outdoor theater performances, uh, which the late Bill Driver, an Englishman who ran the theater program at Bard during the time that Betsy and Blythe were students, uh, did productions outdoors, Midsummer Night's Dream, a whole series of productions in the garden. Um, and then um, many years later, decades later, uh, Leon Levy and Shelby White um, uh, in creating the Levy Economics Institute, um, decided that this building needed to be renovated and the garden restored to some great extent, and uh, that the views opened up, and so that um, there could be um, a better use for the building uh, as an academic building, which it is now, or classrooms and library and offices in an Economics Research Institute, a much more appropriate use of the building, remaining, leaving the remaining land and garden open to undergraduates. The uh, story of an unwelcome neighbors as a college was repeated with the Delafield estate, Montgomery Place, uh, where the Delafield family particularly didn't like the college, nor its president, including myself. Um, uh, and, uh, but uh, one of the ironies of history is that eventually, um, uh, when historic Hudson Valley bought the property from the Delafield family. Uh, finally, it didn't want to operate this far north, and so we now are custodians of that uh, piece of land and landscape, which is both historic and very important. So the college uh, inadvertently um, stumbled into the role of being custodians of a historic landscape and historic use of nature. Gardens are a mirror of history. Um, for years that we taught in our required great book series, Jane Austen's Mansfield Park, which is a novel really about uh, garden styles reflecting both culture and um, values, uh, in that case, in England. Um, and uh, so the garden is a very important place um, historically and uh, as a reminder of our own history and our own relationship to the natural world. And uh, it has a continuing function, not only for weddings and events, but um, the 2,000 undergraduates that are here on campus from all over the world uh, cherish this spot. And uh, it's undeniably beautiful. It tells a lot about America at the turn of the century. And um, it is um, a fabulous place, a fabulous site. Uh, and uh, it's in the normal life of trying to teach people everything from quantum physics to economics. The preservation of a garden is a, is a luxury which um, we would like to be able to afford and to restore it to a permanent um, condition uh, to which it, it deservedly um, uh, should have. So it is, um, I'm terribly grateful uh, to Betsy and to all of you and to the Garden Conservancy for the interest uh, in this, now we have a uh, thousand acres uh, along the Hudson, uh, much of it uh, defined by um, uh, historic beauty. We're pleased to have placed an architectural monument in the Frank Gehry building on the land as well. So it's not only about a nostalgic um, impression of the past, but it's also about the relationship of landscape uh, to our own times and to modern architecture. Uh, so my duty is to uh, welcome uh, James Brayton Hall, who is the CEO of the Garden Conservancy, and um, he uh, used to um, uh, be the deputy director of the Norton Museum of Art, and he's um, a distinguished um, expert in landscape architecture and landscape design, and um, has devoted his career to the preservation and translation of um, uh, the visual configuration 
uh, of, of the natural world um, by humans. And uh, it is, um, uh, this is a, a, a terrific example. And it is, um, so it, it's very special for us that the Garden Conservancy has taken an interest in this particular garden. And um, I, uh, I, I hope the panel discussion is both lively, perhaps even controversial, and uh, I don't wish it to be scandalous, but um, uh, it is very important. The last thing I want to say is that preserving the garden and the landscape is a very important tacit lesson to future generations of undergraduates. Uh, the presence of such a, a treasure or facility uh, for succeeding generations of young people is a reminder of the importance of preserving memory of the past in an age of uh, a kind of euphoria about the power of technology. There is the illusion that the past um, need not be worried about and uh, the past has no connection to future and one's own life. But actually, uh, the nature of technology and many of its downsides, which we see so powerfully, um, needs to be counteracted. And uh, the breathtaking beauty and artistry and imagination um, of the garden and um, its preservation is a reminder uh, how important it is not to erase memory and uh, consideration of the past as we contemplate what we should do in the present and future. So um, it is, um, I think it's a perfectly appropriate place for this kind of facility and uh, perhaps the most vital in the continuing evolution of our culture. So without further ado, James Hall. Thank you, I wanna thank Leon Botstein and the whole the whole team here at Bard College for providing this wonderful setting for our event today. And I also want to personally thank Leon for a great idea for an upcoming symposium, The Scandalous Garden. I think that, <laughs> I think that we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a big turnout for that. Um, we're thrilled to be here celebrating this beautiful Blythewood Garden here on Bard's campus in the heart of the Hudson, at the Hudson River National Historic Landmark District. As Leon pointed out, Blythewood's classic beauty is in peril. The bones of its garden, its walls, paths, structures, and most particularly, its terracotta balustrades are crumbling. The importance of this garden as a unique cultural resource prompted the Garden Conservancy to partner with Bard College to rehabilitate Blythewood's elegant walls and structures. These gardens, as we know, did not decay overnight, and the project to return it to its former glory will also be a lengthy process. Where should we begin? Bard and the Garden Conservancy have pulled together existing records and historical material and commissioned engineering studies of the garden. The, the, engineering, the work has already begun. The engineering study is complete. Currently, we are awaiting the results of a historic structures report, the next logical step, and very important for funding, uh, actually essential for funding, uh, the historic structures report that will provide critical information for our rehabilitation plan. Perhaps the most important step has been to been to bring together the Friends of uh, Blythewood Garden, thanks to Betsy, uh, a group of passionate supporters of the garden who have volunteered their time and their energy to help move this very important project forward. The Garden Conservancy, for those of you who don't know our organization, was founded 29 years ago on the belief that preserving gardens for future generations is important and that gardens as cultural resources matter. For nearly our 30 years, as I said, 29 years just this year, We've been partnering with gardens across the country. We've, we've partnered with over 80 gardens uh, across the country in our 29 years, working to preserve these living works of art. Tonight, we're here to talk about gardens that are heavily dependent upon their architectural elements. We will hear from three experts here on the, the dais with me, who will present different perspectives on the challenges of preserving these fragile cultural resources. I'm excited to hear from our panelists. Um, especially because I, I selected them. They were exactly the people that I wanted to, I wanted to, to talk to about this. That's, that's one of, the, one of the, the privileges of being the CEO. And then lead them through a discussion, a brief discussion afterwards, and then open up um, uh, the floor to, uh, to your questions and, uh, and listen to how their experience have, cha have shaped their individual preservation efforts. 
Uh, so with no further ado, I want to introduce our wonderful speakers. Judith Tankard here is an art historian specializing in landscape history. She received an MA in art history from the Institute of Fine Arts in New York, uh, New York University, and taught history at the Landscape Institute of Harvard University for over 20 years. She's the award-winning author or co-author of, of 10 illustrated books on landscape history, including her newest title, Ellen Shipman and the American Garden. She was formerly a vice president of the Beatrix Farron Society and serves as an advisor for several preservation organizations. Stephen Burns is, uh, is founded the Untermeyer Gardens Conservancy in 2011 and is its president. A graduate of Princeton and Columbia Universities, Burns is a founding partner of BKSK Architects. Burns served as a commissioner of the New York City Landmarks, Landmarks Preservation Commission from 2004 to 2010 and was on the board of Wave Hill, uh, the brilliant, beautiful garden in the, uh, in the Bronx, from 2000 to 2010. He founded the Untermeyer Garden Conservancy in 2010 and began fundraising to hire its first horticulturalist. The Conservancy's current, uh, the, the, the uh, Untermeyer Garden Conservancy currently supports a staff of, ten, of seven horticulturalists and has initiated and supported numerous and quite remarkable critical restoration projects at the garden. The gardens are once again a showplace and are attracting people from near and far and are also very important uh, community and civic resource. Sarah Vance is the director of the Blue Garden in Newport, Rhode Island, before which she was a senior associate at Reed Hildebrandt Landscape Architecture. Reed Hildebrandt Landscape Architecture was the team that developed the rehabilitation plan for the Blue Garden. Her role included analyzing the original drawings and developing planting plans for the garden. As director, she ensures the, de the design intent of the garden's plan and works to maintain it as an accessible and sustainable landscape. Sarah received her master's degree in landscape architecture with distinction from the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. She's editor of the book, The Blue Garden, Recapturing an Iconic Newport Landscape by Arlen Levy. So without further ado, we're going to open it up to our speakers and, um, and after their presentations, we will discuss and open up to the floor for questions. Thank you.